Hello and welcome to the latest instalment of the What If interactive war game campaign from the Battle of Preston Pans Heritage Trust here in Scotland. This is our 20th video update. And it also happens to be our first birthday. Yes, believe it or not, the campaign has been running for a full calendar year. So before I go any further, I just want to say a big thank you, firstly, to Brett and Dave, who, without whom, uh, in their modelling talents and their gaming time, uh, we simply wouldn't have been able to get this far. But also to everybody who's watched, followed, voted on the strategic decisions over on Facebook, uh, given us so many enthusiastic comments and supportive comments uh, on the videos over the past year. We thought this might have lasted a few weeks, maybe a few months if we were lucky. Uh, but thanks to the support we've had, we've had the encouragement to keep it rolling. Now, it may be a new year for us, but it is not for our competence, of course. So let's get back into the campaign and let's catch up on what's been happening in the month uh, since the Jacobites retreated into the city of Worcester. Now, when I last reported on the campaign, things were looking pretty bleak for the Jacobites. If the defeat at Petersfield had destroyed their hopes of marching on London, the subsequent engagement at Littleton just outside Winchester had pretty much destroyed their hopes of continuing the campaign in England at all and driven the Jacobites into full retreat. The Duke of Cumberland, as we see here, uh, was able at Littleton to collect the captured standards of the French regiments which had been destroyed during that retreat, a uh, large number of prisoners taken, and the Jacobites essentially losing most of the French support uh, that they had gained during their march into the south. Charles Edward and his army have managed to shake off Cumberland's pursuit simply by being able to move faster, more desperately perhaps, uh, and get to Worcester. Uh, Cumberland, knowing that he can't quite catch them, uh, has moved to Oxford where he needs to do some consolidating political action as well because uh, that had been the HQ for the Jacobite army for some time and had offered it some support. Now, from Worcester, the Jacobites have to get back to the north. There is a substantial body of Jacobite soldiers in and around Edinburgh. Uh, these are all men who've been recruited by the automatic recruitment rolls uh, over the course of the campaign and the nearly six months that the Jacobite army has been in England. So just as happened historically, in fact, we find a retreating Jacobite army coming out of England, hoping to link up with a sizable body of men who've been recruited in its absence. The Jacobites decide that the uh, sensible way to go is up to Newcastle, where they do have a garrison uh, and they can potentially pause uh, and reconsider their options. The Jacobites were able to move on Newcastle pretty much unmolested. The small militia force under the Duke of Devonshire at York isn't able to uh, interfere with them. It's simply too small, so it stays behind its walls. Uh, Cumberland, uh, marching much slower with his much larger force, uh, does divert to York. Uh, he discharges the southern English militia regiments back to their county bases to serve as a watch against any potential French landings uh, and uh, northern militia units uh, such as are available from Manchester and York, are incorporated into Cumberland's army for the march northwards. So Charles Edward brings his army safely to Newcastle. Uh, there's uh, a good 100 miles now between him and uh, Cumberland, uh, the lead extending by the day. This means he's able to take a little bit of time. He does actually stop the army for a few days uh, in Newcastle, resupplying, recovering, stabilizing its morale a little bit and making the decision as to what to do next. We gave the Jacobites a number of options. Uh, they could try and hold the line at the Tyne. Uh, they could leave a small garrison behind at Newcastle uh, to oblige Cumberland to besiege it. If you remember, there was quite a, a, an intense uh, siege of Newcastle by the Jacobite forces on their way down. So it was uh, quite a hard fought victory here and uh, no doubt the Prince was loath to abandon it. Nevertheless, the decision was taken uh, that uh, the Newcastle garrison would be evacuated uh, and uh, the gates blown and Newcastle's uh, Jacobite occupation comes to an end after uh, almost five full months. And the Jacobite army continues its retreat to the north. Thanks to the presence of Colonel Durand and his uh, militia and marine force at Berwick, the Jacobites take the inland route uh, through Otterburn over Carter's Bar and on to Jedburgh. They link up with Tullibardin at Dalkeith, uh, and the army is therefore making quite a brave show when it enters Edinburgh on the 10th of May, Charles Edward occupying the palace of his ancestors. 
there's a lot of work being done by the prince and his officers now to restore morale, to, to uh, make sure uh, that the cause is reinvigorated after the setbacks that it has endured uh, during the campaign in England. Now they've got a bit of time to breathe, things don't actually look so bad. Yes, the army has suffered a succession of defeats, and notably the French forces have suffered uh, defeats that have reduced them to just a couple of battalions now incorporated into the prince's main force. But Let's remember their achievements so far. They have defeated and destroyed Marshal Wade's army. They have defeated the Duke of Cumberland in County Durham previous to their march down into the south of England. That means that although their situation looks pretty uh, difficult, the Duke of Cumberland leading the British forces also has very little by way of a reserve. In fact, the main part of Cumberland's army is the Hessian force, and uh, then a large proportion of the available forces he has are militias. Cumberland suffering one further defeat would be in very difficult situation indeed. So the Jacobite army, now that it's recovered in size, rising at Edinburgh to 13 full battalions and a half battalion with two squadrons of horse uh, and uh, still four gun batteries, is in a fighting condition. It is potentially still able to take the field and challenge Cumberland. Cumberland himself moves up to Newcastle on the 11th of May, occupying the town just the day after uh, Charles Edward reaches Edinburgh. Cumberland, he has 12 full battalions and one half battalion of infantry. A large proportion of that, as I say, over half, in fact, is uh, Hessian. Uh, but he has a substantial advantage, seven squadrons to the Jacobites too, in terms of cavalry and an advantage in artillery as well. There's a further three and a half battalions in Berwick. So if Cumberland can merge with Durand's force there, he has a substantial numerical advantage. But he still has no depth of reserve if he were to suffer a setback. So all of a sudden, the Jacobite position doesn't look quite as terrifyingly bleak as it did at Littleton uh, just over a month before. Another important consideration is that many of the troops that have joined Charles Edward on his return to Edinburgh, these are Highland troops that have been raised whilst he's been campaigning in England. That means that the imbalance in the Prince's army that was really felt at Petersfield, the lack of the offensive power uh, of the Highland charge was really noticeable there. Uh, so uh, this reinvigorates the army, reinvigorates the Prince's confidence in what he might be able to do. Now, it must be said that the Council of War in Edinburgh was the most comprehensive debate we've seen in the campaign so far over on Facebook. Lots of comments, lots of discussion and consideration over the ramifications of each of the uh, potential options. And uh, true to form for a Jacobite Council of War, uh, a number of people also bemoaning the fact that all the best decisions uh, have already been squandered uh, earlier in the campaign. Nevertheless, there was consideration of a potential retreat back towards Stirling and potentially even beyond that uh, north of the Forth. The garrisons at Edinburgh and Stirling could either be withdrawn or be used uh, to hold Cumberland up uh, with long protracted delaying sieges whilst the Jacobites recruited in the north. But there are political and financial consequences to this, of course, uh, and the Prince is not yet keen on the idea of abandoning the lowlands. Another option was to try and defend Edinburgh or the approaches to Edinburgh. The presence of a hostile force at Berwick-upon-Tweed largely renders the uh, Tweed line undefensible, but there are potential geographical barriers, uh, the Lammermuirs, the Pass of Pease, potentially a, a barrier into East Lothian, the Tyne, uh, a barrier within East Lothian, and uh, the Esk, uh, the last line um, where the Battle of Pinky was fought, perhaps near Musselburgh, um, as another option. Uh, there were more ambitious possibilities, though. Now that the Jacobite army has recovered in size and, uh, and looking for the opportunity to get an advantage and restore its morale with a victory, could Berwick be threatened by the main Jacobite army, which certainly heavily outnumbers it? Uh, the reality, though, is that although the prince's army can get to Berwick before Cumberland can, 
it's a pretty tight race and it probably wouldn't leave them time for an investment. They would have to assault Berwick in order to take it. Now, Durand in assaulting Berwick against uh, a relatively small garrison suffered quite high losses. It's unlikely, therefore, that Charles Edward is going to want with the uh, numerical uh, balance so fine to risk his men in an assault on uh, a heavily defended position here. The other option proposed was that the Jacobites go back on the attack so that they risk a battle not within Scotland, uh, but in the north of England, uh, and they stop Cumberland uh, penetrating into uh, Scotland itself. Uh, this would be done by marching the army pretty much back the way it had come, back through Jedburgh, uh, and then coming down to threaten Cumberland before he can move towards the border, certainly before he can link up with uh, Durand at Berwick. This is a gamble. It's forcing a battle. It's forcing a battle on as close to even terms, though, as the Jacobites are likely to get without uh, retreating further uh, and uh, attempting uh, to fight it out in the Highlands. The decision by a substantial margin in the end is for the most ambitious of the proposals, marching the Jacobite army back onto the offensive in order to fight the decisive battle potentially outside of Scotland uh, and to prevent Cumberland from gaining the numerical advantage that would be given by linking up with Durand at Berwick. So the Jacobites march out. They march out down through Lauderdale and they head towards Jedburgh. But at Kelso, they decide to change tack. Instead of marching down Jedburgh and then heading off towards Newcastle along that route, they decide to cut across sooner rather than later because it's expected that Cumberland will want to link up with Durand uh, as soon as he can to knock uh, this option off the table for the Jacobites. So they cut across, they cross the River Tweed at Coldstream, they come across past Flodden Battlefield in fact, and then the intention is to get onto the North Road and head down it, encountering Cumberland somewhere along the way. What the Jacobites don't know, of course, is that Cumberland is already on the march, he's already heading north, and so it seems that the tranquil landscape of Northumbria is about to host the decisive battle for this campaign. And that is as far as I can take our story. The armies are in motion, they are going to collide. I'm pretty sure where they're going to collide now, uh, and as soon as the battle has been fought, I'll bring you the news. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you again soon.